So there are lots of themes in Genesis that we, we could have chosen to talk about. You can think of new beginnings, creation, a new beginning after the flood, a new beginning with the calling of Abraham. They're all over the place, these new beginnings. There are plenty of blessings. Just read a little bit now. There's the blessings that Isaac gave to Jacob and Esau, the blessings that Isaac gave to Jacob and Esau, and the possible tangle there. Or there's the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons. We, we could talk for hours about those, couldn't we? Oh, and there are rivalries. My word, there are rivalries. Rachel and Leah, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Lot's herdsmen with Abrams. There's a lot going on in these families. There are lapses of faith. We could talk about those too. And there's brotherly love. Or the lack of it. Do you know, there, there's so much going on here that's about people. About us. The kind of people that we are, as, as I intimated last night. It's about us. We need, we need to be there. Not just looking at it and watching them, but thinking about them and being with them and sharing their experiences. But I want us to start with something that I think is really positive, which is why we read these verses in chapter 2. Because God said in verse 18, the Lord God said in verse 18, I will. Now, now up until now, through chapter 1, it's been God said, let us. But now it's the Lord God saying, I will. And you don't need to know very much about the English language to know that there is a difference between let us and I will. A huge difference. Trouble is, the Bible wasn't written in English. And I don't know any Hebrew. So I've got a problem. So I did speak to, to Brother Ewan in, in Mumbles Ecclesia, who, who studied Hebrew in Israel, and I just said, you know, am I making something out of this that isn't there, or is it there? And he checked, and yeah, it's there, all right. In this I will, there is a declaration of intent, of purpose. And when the Lord God says I will, you know it's going to happen. It is going to happen. And he says, I will make a help fitting for Adam, the man. So a help to do what? what, what what's it all about? Well, we know that Adam was put in the garden to keep it and to tend it. So did he, did he need an agricultural helper? Surely not. I mean, I mean, the animals were already there, weren't they, when Eve was formed? And we know that historically animals have been a great help in agriculture. Oxen for ploughing, horses for towing, asses for carrying. No problem there, but they're not what is needed. A help fitting. Why was nothing else suitable? Well, let, let's just go back to chapter 1 and verse 27. So, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So there's the, there's the reason explained for us. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And quite clearly, no other part of creation could do that with Adam. Adam needed the woman, a help fitting meat for that purpose, that purpose, to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth. And together, that's what they were to do. So there's a blessing. That's their blessing. 
But it's, it's not the first blessing that's given in Scripture, actually. The first one is earlier on in chapter 1, verse, verse 21. And, and this, is, this is interesting, I think. Verse 21, God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. It's almost, almost word for word, the same blessing, isn't it? Be fruitful, be multiply, fill or replenish, not subdue it. That was different for Adam and Eve. So that was very good, that creation, and that which God saw that he had made. And so when we put all of that together, this blessing and this purpose of God is that his creation should show his glory. It was good. And that the union of man and woman, of Adam and Eve, should show the glory of God, should be good. And they were made in the image of God. And distinct from the rest of creation, had the will to choose between the right and the wrong, to obey or disobey. So we know a little bit about what the blessing was. We know a lot about what the purpose was. Be fruitful be multi and multiply and fill or replenish the earth to show the glory of God in the majesty of his creation. And there were failures. There are failures throughout this book of Genesis. There are failures throughout the scripture. There are failures throughout history. It, it, it started in Eden. There was the failure of Cain with Abel. Seth's descendants went wrong. So that by the time we get to chapter six, when we got Noah, my word, it's in a dreadful state, and God repents. There were the failure of some of the lines after Noah. Even some of the Shemites were unfaithful and went astray. So does that mean that the purpose of God declared in I will has been frustrated? Well, it can't be, can it? If God says, I will, it's going to happen. So despite all that's happened since Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, God's purpose cannot be frustrated. So now we've got a bit of a puzzle, haven't we? How, when, will that which God said he would do be fulfilled? How? When? Now, I'd like you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. And while you're going there, I'm going to give you a health warning. This is the first of Sutton's health warnings. I'm not on the first aid team, but you need to heed this, you know. It's very dangerous in Scripture to take an English word or expression and find the same word or expression somewhere else and say, oh, there must be a link. Because language doesn't work like that. But in Revelation 21, we've got I will again. So I'm, I'm now going against my own health warning. So when you do it, you must be sure that the ideas behind the expression are consistent. You must always look at context. Sorry if that's been a, a little bit preachy, but it is important. We hear it so often now. This word appears here and here. Uh, it must mean the same thing, and sorry, it doesn't always. So Revelation 21, you should be there now. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, we had the first I will. Revelation 21 has the last I will in Scripture. And verse 9 says this. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. 
I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So just with those words alone, it fits in with the idea we've got in Genesis chapter 2 that we've looked at. But we need to be sure, don't we? The New King James Version Study Bible, incidentally, refers to, uh, for this verse, refers to something that's called the majority text. I don't know if you've ever come across the majority text. It says, does what it says on the tin. So what, what they've done is look at all of the available ancient texts and said that the majority say this. Now, they don't do that on the basis of which is more reliable. They're making no judgments of that na nature. The majority say this. The majority text says, I will show thee the woman, the lamb's bride. So that, that's quite interesting. I don't put that forward as, as a definitive statement of what, what the text should say. It's the majority, apparently, according to the New King James Study Bible. But what's the context here in Revelation chapter 21 then? Well, verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, a new beginning. We're back in Genesis 1, 2. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. I make all things new, says the Almighty in Revelation 21. So we're thinking of Genesis. Verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now that's tomorrow's talk. We're going to get there, but I'll just give you a little bit of a flavour now. All things is a Genesis expression. I think we finished with Revelation. Yes, we have. Let's go back to Genesis and just pick up these all things. Genesis chapter 24, verse 36. So here we've got Abraham's servant. He's gone to find a wife for Isaac. And in verse 36, he says this. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. Okay. Chapter 25, verse 5. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. And unto the sons of the concubines, which Abram had, Abram gave gifts. Bit of a contradiction there. We'll have to explore that tomorrow. How can you give everything to one person and still give things to another? Chapter 33 and verse 11. This is Jacob to Esau. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And the margin says that the Hebrew is all things. So this idea of everything, of all things, is a Genesis idea. And it's picked up on here in Revelation, which we've just looked at. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. So I think we can say with a fair degree of certainty that Revelation 21 is taking us back to the things that we are talking about in Genesis. I will, says God, make a helper fitting for this purpose that I have. And despite everything that has gone on over the centuries, over the millennia since, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. God's will cannot be frustrated. So how's it going to happen? Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 contains a few verses that I, I think are pretty clearly, pretty obviously directed us to make us think back to Genesis, to the, the fathers, before we go on to think about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John chapter 1, well, we know how it begins, but I want us to go in at verse 12. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So we know that expression from Genesis, don't we? The sons of God took the daughters of men. But we know what it means as we come through the Gospels, how it is that we are sons, daughters of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. To as many as believed, he gave power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them which believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How is it going to happen? Not because of our strength. Not because of our planning. Not because of our scheming. Not because of our heritage, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, Christadelphian, whatever you might be. None of that at all. But of the will of God. That's how this earth will be replenished. With creation that will show the glory of God. That's how the bride will be presented to the groom. Through the will of God. Not your strength, not mine. And in order to get there, it needed one. One who would say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I will, said God. And just about everybody since has said, no, I won't. I'm going to go my own way. But there was one who said, not my will, but thine be done. So let's go back to Genesis then, please. Genesis chapter 18 now. As things went wrong, we had the flood, we have had Babel, we've got everybody going astray. There was a need to select one man who would be the father of a family that would be the beginnings of a nation. And that man, you will know, because we're in chapter 18, was Abraham, about whom we're going to talk, God willing, on Thursday. Genesis chapter 18, I just want to pick up this, this one, one verse here in verse 19. Speaking of, of God, uh, speaking of Abraham, God says... For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. So here we've got a family that is to be created through this one man. And yes, he did, in the natural sense, command his children and those who were with him. His trained men, they, they became to keep the way of the Lord. And we talk about spiritual Israel, don't we? We, we think that the Lord Jesus said to the scribes and to Pharisees, just because you're the descendants of Abraham, that doesn't make, make you the seed at all. Not the family who will show the glory of God. Who, who will grow together doing justice and judgment. That's verse 19 in Genesis. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So Abraham was chosen. And I say we're going to talk about him a little bit more later on in a couple of days' time, God willing. To keep the way of the Lord. Well, your minds, I'm sure, have gone back earlier. After Adam was expelled, the cherubim were put there, weren't they, to keep the way of the Lord. Let's just go back a little bit to chapter 3. After the fall. Verse 23, verse 24. The Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. There's a difference there, isn't there, between keeping, which was his 
duty originally and tilling it, but that's another subject. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Th this way, this way needs to be kept open. And despite the thorns and the briars and the thistles of this world, which seek to choke it and prevent it happening, God said, I will. And the way of the Lord will be kept open. It has been kept open through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not by the will of man. Not by the flesh. Not by the blood. But by the one who said, I will. I will. So, so let's go back to the blessing that we've already looked at in chapter 1. I want you to notice that the three words we've got in verse 22 and verse 28, in English they're not quite the same, but they're the same. So we'll go to chapter 1, verse 22, first of all. God blessed them, this is the creatures of the seas, saying, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters. And then in verse 28, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Threefold emphasis, if you will, of what God wants. And those, those three words, as far as I can see, only occur in two other places in scripture in the same sort of verse, the same context, the same area. Only two other occasions. So we ought to look at them. Chapter 9 is one of them. So that's Noah, obviously. Here we go. Chapter 9 and verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So it's another new beginning after the flood. God's purpose, God's intent hasn't changed. I will, I will have this earth full of people who will show my glory. Chapter 10 tells us that it went wrong. But anyway, the other occurrence of these three words side by side is not in Genesis, it's in Exodus. Exodus chapter 1. What have we got here? Effectively, another new creation. We've got Israel as a nation coming out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Can you see the, see the similarity that's there even in the AV translation? A new beginning, a new family, a new nation. But there's a difference here, isn't there? And the difference is really underlined for us page or two over, chapter four, when God is speaking to Moses and saying, now this is what you've got to say to Pharaoh. Chapter four, verse 22. Thus shalt thou say, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So this is a, a different kind of family. It's another new beginning. These are those descended from Abraham, forming this new nation who were, could have become kings and priests, showing forth the glory of God to the nations round about. And yes, that was another failure too, wasn't it? It went so wrong. But God's will cannot be frustrated. God will bring the bride to the groom. It will happen. And so as we see time and again in the New Testament, there is 
a spiritual Israel to do just that which God intended, which God purposed, which God said he would do. Let's go back to the beginning again, please, to chapter 3. So we've already said that things went wrong. Excuse me. And consequently, verse 22 of chapter 3. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become of one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken and drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim. What a difference there is there in the way that is expressed from what we got earlier on. He drove him out, forced him out, wouldn't let him back in. Chapter 2 and verse 8 is altogether more gentle. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So there's, there's a gentleness expressed there. And, it, and it's contrasted then in, in the chapter that we've just looked at, chapter 3, that he's, he's driven out and he's not allowed back. And he's now going to have to till the ground and work hard. And so it has been ever since. And the east, the east was shut off, or at the east it was shut off, that he could not get back in. And when we go through Genesis, we find that going eastward is a bad thing. I'm not suggesting that in our, in our society, in our world, east is bad and west is good. Couldn't begin to say that. But let's just pick up a couple of things. Chapter 4 and verse 16. This is Cain being driven out. Verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And then in chapter 11, the AV margin we need to help us here, in verse 2, chapter 11 and verse 2, and it came to pass as they journeyed, the AV says, from the east, the margin says, eastward, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and Shinar became Babylon. So it's not a good thing. But you, you know, don't you, there was one who reversed that trend. The, the, there's one who went from the east to the west, and, and that was Abram. From Earl of the Chaldees, chapter 13 and onwards, we, we, we've got him coming westwards, into the land. Let, let's have a quick look at chapter 12 and just see a little bit about Abraham. <coughs> chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I said chapter 13 a minute ago, and of course I didn't mean that. I meant chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So there he is in Ur of the Chaldees, which we'll talk about more on Thursday. And he, he's got to get out, and he does it in stages, to a land that he doesn't know. And he's promised that he's going to be a great nation. And, you know, when we talk about Abram's faith, we think about the faith that he had in obeying. And when we talk about his faith being tested, we might think about the offering of Isaac. But it was tested all the time, wasn't it? And, and we get little glimpses of that. So he's got to go to this land where he's going to become a great nation. Look at chapter 12 and verse 10. There was a famine in the land. You know, so he's, he's, he's gone from Ur of the Chaldees 
He's got these promises. He comes through the, the fertile crescent of going around the top there to a land where there's a famine. And not only that, chapter 15, chapter 15, Well, it's not chapter 15 at all. There's a verse which I haven't written down which just says very plainly, and Sarah was barren. I've obviously got the wrong passage written down, which is fairly typical. You can expect that to happen quite a lot, but it's there in this area. I'll find it for you perhaps and tell you on Thursday if you don't find it yourselves. So we, we've got this promise, get out of this place, go to this land which I'm going to show you, you're going to become a great nation and the scripture is at pains to show us that the land was barren, there was a famine, that Sarah was barren, there were no children and yet Abraham believed I, he's going to be a great nation. Chapter 15, I've got written down, but I can't see it there that I want, so not to worry about that. So all of that again takes us back, doesn't it, to what we saw in John chapter 1. How is it going to happen? Well, Abraham, you know, this family of yours is not going to come about because of your scheming. It's not going to come about because you can take Sarah's handmaid and make your family that way. It's not going to come out through the power of your flesh. The covenant was confirmed through circumcision. It, it's not going to come about through blood. You remember that we're told very clearly about the age of, Abra uh, uh, of Sarah and that her natural cycles had ceased. It doesn't happen that way. This family is about the will of God. That's how the sons of God are made. That's what we see in John chapter 1. That takes us back again to Revelation. I will bring the bride, the lamb's wife. So let's just think a little bit more about the families of the earth that are described for us in Genesis there's a split, there's a division. And that's another of the themes that we get in Genesis, about separation. We've seen how Cain was driven away. He went eastward. He was separated from Seth. We, we see how Abraham is taken out of Ur of the Chaldees and he, he lives with his father for a while, but that's not enough. Go on into the land. We could think about Abram and Lot separating and one choosing Sodom. Perhaps he didn't know what he was doing and the other staying in the land that at times was barren, barren and infertile. It's about separation. So let's, let's go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4 tells us about the line of Cain, the things that they did, the way that they lived. We, we've got going towards the end about, uh, of Cain and the way he lived, his family, and the threats that were made. Verse 24, if Cain shall be avenged, avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. A dreadful line, a dreadful family. And then in chapter 5, we've got the line of Seth. Let's just look at a few of these things in a bit more detail then. So chapter 4 and verse 12. To Cain, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. That, that's what God said to Cain because of what he had done. And Cain said, oh, no, I won't. I'm not going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. I'm, I'm not going to listen to you and what you've 
decreed for me. How, how do we know he said that? Verse 16. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, knew his wife and conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. I'm not going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. I'm going to build a city, and this city is going to be in existence after my days, says Cain, in effect, in defiance of what God had said about him. We've looked then at Lamech's boast. I want you to think about that, about this city named after his son. We've already talked briefly about an inheritance. Inherit all things, it said in Revelation 21. So, so here was Cain building an inheritance for his son and his son's sons. That's what he wanted. That's what the world wants. Even now, building a name for myself that will live on after me. Psalm 49. Can we just go there? Psalm 49. Starting in verse 10 of Psalm 49. He seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honour abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. Cain, that's you. Just like the beasts that perish, the beasts of the field. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. And then verse 17. When he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Cain didn't know that, didn't believe that. But you know, all of Cain's line... All of Cain's line perished in the flood. It's a sombre thought, isn't it? That whatever he built, whatever he set for himself and his son and his son's sons was swept away when the flood came. A sombre thought. But at the end of this, in chapter 4 of Genesis, there, there is this glimmer of hope, this, this little ray of light that we've got now in chapter 4 and verse 26. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, and there are a number of different translations, different ways of expressing that expression. The AV margin suggests call themselves by the name of the Lord. But I, I prefer what we've got in the text, actually. Call upon the name of the Lord. And the reason for that is that there are others through Genesis that we are told particularly, explicitly, called upon the name of the Lord. Let's find some of them. So chapter 12, we've got Abraham. Here he is. Verse 8, he removed from thence, chapter 12, verse 8, unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, leaving Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar and called upon the Lord, uh, sorry, an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. It's an expression to do with worship, calling upon the name of the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 4, we've got the same. And to the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Isaac does the same in chapter 26. I want to go to this one, particularly because we'll just 
contrast it with Cain. Chapter 26 and verse 24. The Lord appeared to him in the night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. It, it's to do with worship. It's to do with sacrifice. It's to do with fellowship with God. And men began to do that at the end of chapter 4. In the face of all of this hostility, evil in the world. And this point about Isaac here in this verse. And he pitched his tent there. Just like Abraham, dwelling in tents. So unlike Cain, building a city. For he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He, he, he believed that what God said he would do, he will do. He believed in those promises, those covenants made to Abraham, his father. He knew that what God had said to Abraham, God had performed at least in part. And Isaac was living proof of the power of God. Sarah was barren. And Isaac was born. He knew that if God says, I will, he will. So let's just think a little bit more about this genealogy in chapter 5. And this is going to bring our thoughts to an end. No need for a flashing light. I've got ten minutes left. Genesis chapter 5. Verse 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God. You see, it's repeated, it's emphasised for us. Perhaps it takes us back to, to God walking in the garden with Adam. Perhaps that's the thought. But perhaps it's contrasting with the world around, how difficult it must have been in that godless world that is described and that is about to be swept away how difficult it must have been to walk with God as a son of God keeping in the way but Enoch did it all those years and God took him we're going to finish I think in Jude let's go to Jude Chapter 14, no, verse 14, that's not chapters, verse 14. Jude, of course, is mentioned here in, Enoch, of course, is mentioned here in Jude, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all them, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God will execute judgment. The Lord cometh, he said, and it was so in the flood when that line of Cain was swept away and so much more besides. And we know, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Enoch knew that. Jude knew that. We know that. And so... We need to think about what it is that Jude is saying to us. I'm not going to read all of these verses. Let's just jump through. Verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before 
of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the words that are spoken. Verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Because God has said that he will, and he will bring the woman, the bride, the lamb's wife. May we all be a part of that family. Thank you.